in trying to understand that and thinking thinking how much expertise needs to go into it is part I, I was thinking back to what you first said about the nature of the body that when say we have a, a disease or a, a disorder of some kind there can be so many interlaced interlocking causal factors yet doctors are often experts in just one of those so yeah. is there potentially an, an expert problem here that lots of people are in their particular fields say economics and they only see things through the economics lens do we need to have uh, more jacks of all trades involved or is this a case of i don't know re, re understanding what you need to be to be an expert yeah um so an expert in a complicated system see one of the things about a complicated system is you can break it apart into parts and understand the parts in isolation put it back together and you don't have um, the same kinds of synergies that you have in complex self-organizing systems. So no one has to understand every part of the computer because we can take it apart and put a new CPU in, put a new hard drive in. And you notice that we've treated bodies very much like that. Like, oh, this part's worn out. Let's take it out, put a new one in, or you don't really need this part. As opposed to like, whoa, what happened with the regulatory systems here? And what role did it really play? And, and a gastroenterologist can't you know, and a neurologist and oncologist, they can't really understand any of those parts independent of the other ones because what's happening in the gut via the microbiome, via the gut-brain axis, via the enteric nervous system, via so many different kinds of pathways is affecting what's happening in the nervous system and then mm -hmm. all of the top-down mechanisms. So there is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that an expert problem is how I would describe it. I would say there's a problem of hyper-specialization in complex systems where that is just not the right epistemology. And uh, Alfred North Whitehead wrote this great paper some decades ago called The, the Problem of uh, Overspecialization. And he said, notice how we, uh, the smarter a kid is, the earlier we start moving them into specialization. And we move them further and further into specialization so that by the time they do their PhD, there's a few people in the world that really understand their dissertation. And they have relatively little um, abstraction across domains, lateral thinking into other spaces, et cetera, because they're supposed to be able to do a good job of that specialized expertise. And of course, we know there were benefits of specialization, but uh, I think then there were real problems with it. Um, he said, so when, when all of our A students are thinking about tiny, tiny parts, then who's thinking about the whole? And so we are leaving to people who didn't, you know, excel that well to think about it, or just nobody at all, and it is just a complex kind of system, but it's not necessarily the one that we want or that works effectively. So uh, I wouldn't say what we want is jack-of-all-trades. That's kind of a false dichotomy. I would say people who are studying complex systems and who are studying systems at all and who are studying deeper level generalized principles and things like design that are cross applicable so that they um, can so that they really have the right epistemology to understand the systems that they're looking at and to work with them uh, yes i think that's critical and i think it's been critical for a while but especially in the face of um, machine learning within narrow intelligence right now already and over the next little bit narrow and intelligence via machine learning will just be better at us, better than us, at combinatorics within finite spaces. Um, and it really is generalized intelligence that is at the meaningful place for humans to develop themselves and work. Yeah, and in, in that case, it's um, it looks like the education system and the, the way that we value certain kinds of education is going to need to change. And um, I've heard you speak passionately and passionately in the past about an issue that we, we damp down kids curiosity in the traditional education systems and say no stop looking at that stop playing with that you need to go and learn these specific exercises so yeah. I wonder how you think we can reawaken that kind of curiosity without fear and when I say fear I mean the fear of parents or older generations because they might want to nurture it in their kids they might want they understand the, the necessity for it but if they don't have any answers themselves because they've only yeah. the parents have only got this old-fashioned education how, how can we overcome this this divide and find a way to nurture it in in children yeah, the thing that we call modern Western education is not the only system of education that 
uh, has ever been explored, and it's. I, I don't think it's very hard to have the educational um, philosophy argument that it is just not even a very good one for many definitions of what is a meaningful way to educate a human being. Um, but when you look at kind of the history of how it came about and things like we need, you know, the, the movement into uh, an industrial revolution where we needed people, we needed a lot of people to get trained to fulfill roles within the industrial revolution um, that were pretty fungible, right? Factory line workers were pretty, fun like any of them could do basically what any of the other ones could do. And MBAs are supposed to be able to do pretty much what the other ones can do, and doctors, and so how do we, society needs people to fulfill these roles, so how do we create both an extrinsic incentive economics to get them to do it, and how do we create an education system to train them up into these roles where then we identify them with this role, and this role is really fungible with anyone else who had that training, give or take a little bit. Um, there's going to be profound meaninglessness in that because the uniqueness of self is gone. Their own kind of self-directed process is gone, right? Um, and again, especially in the place of robotic automation, where those jobs are going to be getting automated, um, and not just physical robotic automation, but even the deep, deep learning through a lot of the things that we think of as thinking things, but things that are proceduralizable. Uh, I think that actually makes possible and necessitates a foundational rethinking of what education should be for and really like what society, what civilization should be for. And it is rather, if we, if we can decouple to where the jobs don't need the people to do them, we can also decouple it to where the people don't need the jobs, meaning start to actually change the economic structure because we don't need it to be a source of extrinsic incentive. Then we get to say, okay, now we can actually have a system of intri where intrinsic incentive is deeper to both the economics and the education. So what is an education system where the focus is facilitating each child's unique expression, their unique passion, interest, curiosities, capacities, and following it, right? Um, now you say, how can parents, how can teachers participate with that if they weren't facilitated that way and they don't necessarily know the answer and the kid, the kid's going to ask them questions they don't know answers to. Yeah. If the parent's earnest, if they really are earnest about this, they can go on a process of co-discovery with their kid. And when the kid says, so why is the sky blue? And the parent realizes that they don't actually know, they remember something about diffraction, but maybe it is reflecting the ocean, they don't really fucking know, right? Um, then they can be like, well, let's, let's explore it together. Yeah. yeah. And then rather than push for that exploration to go in the way that they're interested in, pay attention to the kid's interest and ask them, like, find out why they're interested in it and what their, what their intuition about it is, what their thought is, and help, help go through the process of helping them learn how to learn and facilitating their interest in life and letting their interest in life and their learning reignite the adults also. I think that's a, that's a key ingredient there that, that you mentioned I hadn't thought of, which is not only to go and find the answer for the kid, but say, first of all, what, what do you think and why do you wonder that? And try and tune into, into the nature of that curiosity. But, it's the, the dynamic that I often see, and I even feel it myself, is a sort of sense, a little bit of shame and fear. If someone mm -hmm. asks me a question, I feel I ought to know the answer to. And so mm -hmm. it's a, kind of a conversation, too, about putting aside our own ego and need to appear a certain way in front of others. Well, there's a, there's a few fun things here. So let's first address the part about um, asking the kid why they're interested. So the kid asks why the sky is blue. Maybe that was the question they asked in the moment, but they're just really curious about why any color has color. Hmm. And they could just as easily ask, why is the leaf green? And they really just want to know what color is, right? And Or they're really asking kind of a question about um, God and existential things about, like, why did the creator make it that way? Because that's the way they're thinking about it. And so they, they're, there's a, they're thinking about things like, why is anything the way that it is? Or they're asking a question about, 
why is it that we subjectively experience it as blue and does that relate to what is objectively true and do we all experience it the same way? If you don't know, you're going to go into answering it the way you think they're asking it. And then you're going to find them get bored pretty quickly and then you're going to get frustrated and try and get them to pay attention. Mm. And so it's pretty important to actually pay attention to what is the real inquiry. And then not you go find the answer as if the answer already fucking exists. They might be asking questions the answers don't fully exist to. And you get to like be in that process of discovery together where the answer matters less than the investigation, the inquiry, the thinking about it. And some of the best questions are when they get to things where we don't know the answers and their intuition about it might be as good as anybody's. Yeah, that's the, the whole, the, I guess the the stereotype, the picture of the from the mouths of babes thing where you, you start seeing the world from a new angle just because somebody is asking a question which is unencumbered by years of cultural conditioning. Yeah, and you know, if we're asking about, so what's fundamentally real? Is consciousness real and this is all arising in my consciousness? Is is matter fundamentally real and my consciousness is an epiphenomenon of neural networks? If, if we ask a question where we where the real answer right now is we don't fucking know. Those are the best thinkers in the world. Vehemently disagree on this. Um, then <laughs> it's a place where you get to actually have a dialogue with them really on equal footing because you actually can't, even though you can tell a whole history of Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy on it, you, that still just brings you to, I, I just told you a whole lot of things about why I don't know. Um, and so if you can come back to the like fascination and the interest you and you're in the same place as them and they do have they are touching it for the first time in different ways how do you think we can get to to, to tackle the other point that I, I mentioned is how do you think we can get to the point where we're not worrying about admitting our ignorance maybe it's not yeah. such a big deal to a child but i think that we in in the west loosely speaking it's it's seen as largely not okay to admit, oh, I don't know, even though I feel that I should. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see uh, what a great tool to control other people that is. <laughs> yes. And you can see how little real freedom you have and how little real ability for peace or intimacy or honesty with other people you have well, that bullshit's running in you. Now, let's step back and think about it like this for a minute. Let's think about the field of the knowable and the field of the unknowable as ontologic categories. Well, we, let's think of them as epistemologic categories for a minute. Can you explain so, to our audience what the difference is? Yeah, so ontology is, in philosophy, the... Uh, the inquiry into the study of what is fundamentally real, what exists. And epistemology is how do we know? Like, do we think this exists because we're measuring it and all getting the same thing, because we're experiencing it, because we're intuiting it, because we're doing math? Like, what is, the, what is the right process of coming to believe anything that we might believe? And so there's this deep relationship between what we think is real and how we think about anything. Um, and so those are some, some of the deep categories in philosophy. So let's think about the knowable stuff and the unknowable stuff. Now, Heisenberg set a limit on knowability at the quantum mechanical level, right? Said the position and the momentum of a quantum particle are not simultaneously knowable. And here's the big deal. It wasn't an epistemologic limit. It wasn't we just can't get enough information about it. It was an ontologic limit. They don't both exist at the same time. At the level of the quantum, it does not actually have a fixed amount of momentum and a fixed amount of position. It has something weirder than that, like a probability distribution about how much of those things it has. And so there is a limit to the knowable. And then you say, okay, well, how many quantum particles are there in the universe? And what are all the interactions between them? And how much unknowable is there from that? And it's like, okay, that's, you know, that's a, a profound set. And Gödel's incompleteness theorem said, set a limit on the knowable when it comes to mathematics, right? The foundational axiomatic set of math is infinite. Well, we, you can't know infinite shit. The knowable is always finite. 
But the unknowable is infinite. So it's important to, to get first that the unknowable is a larger class than the knowable, fundamentally. And then within the knowable, you have the known and the unknown. And the known is, I have a reasonable confidence margin through whatever process that my understanding of this is pretty good. And the unknown is, this is hypothetically knowable stuff, we just don't know it yet. And there's plenty of that. Within that, the unknown is also a larger class than the known is within the knowable. Now, why, why am I specifying this? I'm specifying it because if I think that I should know most things, then I actually just don't know the deepest things about the nature of knowability itself. And so that idea, like, oh, someone asked me something I don't know. There's something wrong with me. Like, to just realize how ridiculous that fucking thought is. <laughs> yeah, and, it's... Oh, and, and you go. And to instead say, okay, well, the, there, there is an infinite class of things I don't know. And couldn't know. And then there's a bunch of things that I could know that I don't. And that's forever. And that is fascinating, right? That is in, in, enthralling. It's like you get to touch a sense of uh, awe in that. And so I think that reframe of just really getting how vast reality is and how complex and how deep and, and then being able to have a totally different humility in relationship to it. There's um, an emotional and even spiritual element to this, I think, that people find, or I've found, if you study something in depth, when you go into the subject at first, you can make all sorts of strong and sweeping claims because you don't know enough to know how complicated it is, and that's quite exciting. <laughs> and then the more that you learn, you realize, uh-oh, I feel like I have to equivocate over everything all the time because everything's so complicated, I wish I could go back to when I knew less. But then the transformation can happen where you can become comfortable knowing that you right. don't know much. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a fun process, right? So we will see, you go to an academic conference and you'll see the top scientists in a domain almost tripping over themselves yeah. to not make any real statements because <laughs> um, they don't want to say something wrong in front of all the other people that probably know a shit ton of stuff that they, that they don't know that is relevant where what they're saying might be wrong. And then you look at um, people who are radically less educated about a field and, you know, adamant and passionate about it. So now, I, I basically, I shared half of the story, 